It's August the 4th, I believe, isn't it? Uh, 2019. Didn't ever think this time would get here when I was young, but it's here. And uh, we're teaching on something that's very uh, synthesized in Scripture. When you see something over here and it repeats over here, don't think they are two different subjects. They're not. You have to see how they fit together. And we're talking about God's covenant with four things. And you'll find this in the ninth chapter of Genesis. And uh, in the ninth chapter, God says, I'll establish my covenant in verse 9. He says, and it will be with the living creatures that is with you, Noah, with the fowl of the air, of the cattle of the field, and every beast of the earth with you. So he says, you and with the cattle and with the birds of the air, with the fowl, with the fowl, and with the beast. And the king of the beast, all through the Bible, is the lion. The king of the fowl is the eagle. And the head of the cattle is the ox. And then man. So wherever you see these four, that will be the sign of God's covenant. And then God puts his bow in the cloud, his kesheth. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. That's the bow. We call it a rainbow, and it is, but it's more than that. The word kesheth means a bow for bending or a war bow. So this is God's war bow. Wherever you find these beasts and you got the war bow of God, he, ha he put his bow in the cloud. When you look at a rainbow from the top of a mountain, it is a circle or the in a plane. It's a circle. I've got pictures of a rainbow and it's wheels and wheels. It's a wheel and a wheel. And the goddess of the rainbow is was called Iris. And the iris of the eye is a wheel and a wheel. And we've gone through this already. And the inner part of the iris of the eye is retractable. And when you punch someone in the eye, this thing starts closing up on the iris, what we call the iris, closes up upon the center of the eye, which is the pupil. That's where light goes in. And God says to to Zechariah, Zechariah, the second chapter, he said, Israel is the apple of my eye. The word apple is the word baba, and it means pupil. When you punch someone in the eye, that iris starts bending, and it's a wheel in a wheel. The rainbow is a wheel. And the rainbow, amazing, all we see is a portion of it. And the rainbow has got seven colors in it. When the light enters your eye, it goes through prisms. The first thing it goes through is through the prisms of your lens. And the lens, the lens is supposed to be like one one thousandth of an inch thick and it's a triangular prism triangular and going through that it begins to refine refine light and when you God says if you touch Israel you punch me in the eye that's why the Bible says in Second, uh, Second Thessalonians 1 and eight, 7 and 8 that Christ is going to come back in flaming fire 
taking vengeance and all those that know not God and obey not the gospel. The Bible says in the in the 19th chapter of Revelation, when he comes back on a white horse, that he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire because his people have been punched in the eye. Now, I got to get back to where I was last week one more time. When you go over here to Revelation 4, you see a rainbow. Revelation, the fourth chapter. You see a rainbow and you see these four animals. Revelation 4, we see the throne of God. The throne of God is no longer in literal Israel on a literal throne. The throne of God is now. This was the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant, where he came down and set up on that throne. Then you had the brazen sea here. You had the, you had the uh, one here. You got it right here. All right. All right, I'll get to it here in a minute. Boy, it was, must have been on the other end of this thing. There it is. There's the brazen sea. And this is the Ark of the Covenant they're bringing in. They had to carry him on poles. That is, that is biblically correct. They're bringing it to the temple. And this was the throne of God right here. So when you find the throne anywhere in Revelation, it's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what is the Ark of the Covenant now? It's our hearts. So when you see throne, that's what it's talking about. You see the throne here in uh, opened up heaven. Heaven was a term for Israel since they were the ruling class. And when you look in McClinic and Strong, look up heavens, the first thing it will say is the ruling class. Then... Uh, and immediately, verse 2, I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. This is all figurative language. Let me just point out to you one more time. Revelation, the first chapter, the first verse. If you don't think figuratively, you're not going to understand anything that I'm talking about up here in Revelation or in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a book that's equal to Revelation. Now here in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say the revelations. Don't spell it revelations. It's revelation, apocalypsis, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. That's the word revelation. Apo means off with. Calypto. Cover. The word revealed is apo calypto. Apo, it's a form of revelation. Apo, K A L U P T O. And the scripture says that God reveals himself to whomsoever he will. The word mystery is the exact opposite of revelation. Mystery is musturian. And the mystery of Christ is the church. It means the unrevealed facts. God only reveals himself to whomsoever he will. There will many times in Scripture, particularly in Luke, the 10th chapter, he reveals himself to whomsoever he will. And notice what he says here. You've got to look at it real close. Which God gave unto him, the revelation of Jesus, God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it. The word signified is the key word here. Signified. Signified, if you'll notice, has the word sign in it. Signified, it, it's 
to signify something, that's the word semiao, S-E-M-E-I-O-O. It is a form of the word simeon. That's whenever the Pharisees in Mark in Matthew the 16th chapter came to Jesus and said, "Give us a sign that you're come from God." We got signs in the Old Testament. We got fire by day and a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. We got our shoes didn't wear out. Uh, our feet didn't get swell up in 120 degrees heat in the desert. Uh, we got manna in the morning and doves in the evening. And we got plenty of water out of a rock, three million people out here in the desert. We want a sign. And he said, you don't get any sign, but the Simeon of the prophet Jonah. Now, the word Simeon means a signal. It means a pointer. Uh, it means a flag or a beacon. It points out something. It's like an arrow. Simeon means, now you've got to keep this in mind when you're studying the book of Revelation. Simeon, it's like if you see a big, if you see this big blimp up in the sky and it says Goodyear on it, it doesn't mean there's a good year up in the sky. It means somebody is advertising Goodyear tires or Goodyear repair place. That's a sign. If you see a, a, something that looks like a train track, that's a pointer. It means down here somewhere there's a store that sells Goodyear tires. If you see a track and there's this, there's this little X there, and it's got red lights all here, and it's got a little little handle coming down. It's a little like a gate post, and you hear ding, 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 ding. That's a sign, that's a pointer, that a train is coming. There's a train down here, stop, get off the track. That's what it's for. That's what this is saying right here. The angel is going to give signs. So anytime you see these signs in here, it doesn't mean actual literal creatures. It means a pointer according to something God has already given us in the Old Testament. Uh, it's to signify it by his angel unto his servant John. So everything John gets is going to be a pointer. You have to learn that in this. So whenever you get over here to the fourth chapter... Now, you've got to look at all this together. When you see in this chapter that there are, there's a throne, that would be the Ark of the Covenant. That should actually be our hearts. And then you got down here in verse 3, there was a rainbow round about the throne, around our hearts. And the rainbow, the rainbow is... So if our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant, uh, Indiana Jones can quit looking for it. It's inside you. It's here. And if there's a rainbow around that, and we can find these four beasts, that's the picture of the covenant. And you've got all of that right in here, just like you got it in Genesis 9. These are not something that's stuck here out of the clear blue sky. God says, well, I think I'll use that again. It's connected directly to Genesis 9th chapter. It's also connected to Ezekiel, the first chapter, because you've got, well, let's just read it right here. We know this is the, it's got 24 elders in verse 4. That's the 24 sons of Aaron, surviving sons, sons of Eleazar and Ithamar. 24th chapter of 1 Chronicles. You can find that. They had 24 sons. They were the surviving sons after God killed Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's two other sons, because they offered strange fire to God. So Eleazar and Ithamar had 24 sons, which were the elders. And these elders, you're going to see in Leviticus 8 and 9, 
And Exodus 28 and 36, they had gold crowns on their heads. They had a mitre. That's a band wrapping around their head. And they had gold crowns that had holiness to the Lord. And then you had a sea, a, a sea of glass, verse 6. And in Exodus 38 and 8, Moses tells all the women, bring your looking glasses so I can make this brazen sea. That sea right there. Actually, it was a small laver when they first made it. But as Israel grew, they, the, all the high priest, all the priests washed at that every morning before they went and offered sacrifice on the altar up here. And they would go back and wash their hands and feet later. Now, so we know this is about the temple. It's doing nothing but describing it. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts, like the Ark of the Covenant, have the law written on fleshy tables of the heart, and the law was written on tables of stone back in the Old Testament. So this is nothing but a picture of the temple, which is us. So he says, And he saw four beasts. They're the same four that he... You say, Jim, why are you repeating that? Maybe y'all already got this, and I can just jump to something else, okay? No, I won't do that. <laughs> you see the four beasts. The first beast, verse 7, was like a lion. The second beast, like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. That's exactly the covenant of God in Genesis 9, isn't it? It's exactly it. This is not... When you... That's one thing I discovered. I started reading the Bible when I was 17, 1956. I couldn't understand none of it. My father would, get, father would get up and read five or six same verses every time he got up and shout and tell stories for 45 minutes. And I thought, I can't understand this. I began to pray, Lord, help me to find the truth. I heard a doctor of theology teach. He spewed out all this information. I think, i got to learn that. That was 63 years ago. And I've been doing nothing but learning ever since. For the four beasts... And it talks about these four beasts. That was them right there in Genesis 9. And then he says, uh, And these 24 elders come and cast their crowns at the feet of him that sits on the throne, which is Jesus. Now he sits on the throne of our hearts. So they cast their crowns. They're saying, We are the sons of Aaron, and we cannot offer the true sacrifice of this spiritual temple of God, which temple you are. So they say, we acquiesce. That's, I love that word. It means we gently submit to your authority. So the 24 priests of Aaron, his surviving sons, cast their crowns at the feet of Christ on the throne. You're not going to cast your crowns anywhere when you get to heaven. And people say, I'm going to cast my crowns at the feet of Jesus. You're not a high priest. You had to be a high priest to cast your crowns. He's the high priest. This is saying, when Jesus is nailed to the cross, nailed, the ironic, Aaron was the older brother of Moses. He was the high priest of God, and all of his sons were high priests. This is a cessation of the Aaronic priesthood and the beginning of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the high priest over this temple. He's the one that sprinkles our hearts. That's what this is talking. It's not so hard if you know something about Old Testament. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel, the first chapter. We've got to look at these four beasts. Ezekiel has the same thing. It has a rainbow. It has the four beasts. Kind of a little different, though. The four beasts is supposed to God, confirm God's covenant. But when you're looking at Ezekiel, you have to know what he is about. Ezekiel is a prophet of God. All right. Ezekiel uh, 
Let's read the first few verses again. And it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives, captives, he was taken captive when Israel was overthrown by Babylon. This Ezekiel, his message is to southern Judah. Southern Judah. You can keep those four animals in mind, can't you? I hope you can. I need that room to write on the board. All right. I need two big boards, so I'll just walk across or walk around the room. All right. Now, Ezekiel, Ezekiel and Daniel, and Daniel, they were carried into the captivity. What do you mean captivity? Well, Israel was a nation for 500 years under kings. Their first king was God. Around the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel, the people said, we don't like Samuel's got two sons, and if they inherit his position as being a prophet, they're both crooked. They're not very nice guys. You can find that in the 8th chapter. Give us a king to rule over us. And God tells Israel in the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel, why is it you wanted a king to rule over you when God was your king? If God was the king of the Jews, who was that? If God was the king of the Jews, who else has been called the king of the Jews? Jesus. Then the God of the Old Testament is Jesus. He said he was the God of the Old Testament. He looked at the Pharisees, said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it in the 8th chapter of John. And they said, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. They went through the roof. You're calling yourself the I am God? They took up stones to stone him. People say, you'll hear Kenneth Copeland say, Jesus never called himself God. When he said, I am, that is saying, I am the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And they said, we'll kill you for that. They said, we're not going to put up with that. That's blasphemy. And Jesus slipped through the crowd. It wasn't his time yet. So he was the God of the Old Testament. Now, because they kept, they kept going after all these gods for 500 years under kings. Zedekiah was the last king of Israel. The first man king was Saul. God picked him out when they said, give us a king. Well, he had Samuel go search down the king who anointed Sam, Saul, and Saul never did anything right. He rebelled against God every day of his life. Before that, they were under judges, and they kept going after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech and Venus and Aphrodite and all these gods and goddesses. And God told them, if you keep going after them, I'm going to scatter you all over the earth. Well, Ezekiel and Daniel, were they had three deportations of Israel into Babylon. Now, Israel was split into two nations because one of their kings, King Solomon, allowed his 700 wives, 300 concubines, which were secondary wives, and he could have children by all of these. Boy, can you imagine the temple with... Huh? Three three thousand, three three hundred, three hundred concubines. 
I'll get it in a minute. 300 concubines. And what Solomon did, he allowed his wives, he was actually, he would marry all these foreign women because he wanted to, what he was wanting to do was have a treaty with all the kings of the world, so he married people out of their nation in order to have peace with them. He didn't have to do that. All he had to do was what Deuteronomy 28 tells him, follow my laws and my statutes and my commandments, and I'll fill up your basket and your store and your fields, and your children will be born healthy. They won't be stillborn, and you'll go against your enemy one way, and they'll flee seven ways, and it don't matter how many there are. Well, Solomon evidently forgot God's word and went ahead and married these women anyway, and he allowed them to keep their Ashtaroth, their Shemosh gods, which is the sun god of Moab, and all the other gods they served. Ashtaroth is a generic name, a generic term for the female deities. They were all tree goddesses, a Christmas tree. And, the, and what they went after during that 500 year as a nation, they went after the same thing that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ, Mass. And I've got, that's another story. I don't have time to go there. I can go into that and get go all over the place. Well, God finally gets his fill, gets his fill of Israel going after all these other gods. Saul kind of brought it in, but Ahab made it an official, official, that, excuse me, not Saul. Solomon brought it in. He was a good man. I don't know why he did what he did. I'd like to ask him when I get to him, why did you do that? He's probably going to say, for the same reason America did what they did. All right. Politics. Yeah, politics. That's what he was doing. That was a political move on his part. God said, just for that, in 1 Kings, the 11th chapter, he says, I'm going to split the kingdom. I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, Solomon, and give it to your neighbor who is better than you. So he took, he retained Judah. Judah was the fourth son of Israel, or Jacob, Israel. And he put Benjamin with Judah, and they became the southern kingdom. And northern Israel was ruled by Ephraim, the second-born son of Joseph, actually the Bible says they were ruled by Joseph, and Joseph passed the, the laurel to Ephraim, the second-born son of Joseph, and gave that to him in Genesis, the 48th chapter. Genesis 48. Well, northern Israel was headed by Ephraim, so when, when Ephraim was referred to long after he's dead, that's talking about the ten northern tribes. And the Bible says at the end of time, in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, 37th chapter, that God's going to have, take one stick for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and one stick for Judah, and he's going to bring them together at the end of time, and they're going to be one nation in my hand. And right now, they are one nation as of May the 14th, 1948. We can't be far from the end of time. Now, what was Ezekiel doing in Babylon? He was carried away. There were, northern Israel was carried away into captivity in 722 B.C. When you get to southern Judah, which is what Ezekiel is about, Ezekiel and Daniel were carried off into Babylon in one of the three deportations of Israel. These were, the first two were peaceful, five, 
excuse me, 605 and 597. 605 B.C., 597, 96, 97, 96 B.C. This is the, one of these two here is where Ezekiel and Daniel were carried away into Babylon. They were carried over here by Nebuchadnezzar Now, you want to get this whole story, you got to watch last Sunday's tape, watch today, and watch the next time. Now, Ezekiel is over here in Babylon. He's having visions of what God's going to do to Israel because all the time they were a nation, they kept going after these idol gods. So Ezekiel is giving you a picture of what God, the judgment God's going to bring. He's a, Ezekiel is somewhere in the neighborhood, Ezekiel, just call him Zeke. He's in the neighborhood of 597 B.C., 596, 595. And he's given visions of what's God's, what's happening in Israel and the apostasy they're in they're going after these idol gods, and he is seeing what's happening over here. Now, remember Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached in the streets of Jerusalem for 40 years. For 40 years. And he, he is in Israel in 586 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar brings his armies in and slaughters Israel with millions of people and carries, but Ezekiel has been carried away prior to this. Everything Ezekiel's talking about is what God's going to do in 586 B.C. He's going to bring his armies in, level Jerusalem. Now, let's go back here to Ezekiel, the first chapter. He's going to give you the story that's happening to Israel. In the fifth year of the month, well, he was by the river of Kibor that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. God sent these visions to me to show people what's going to happen. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, <laughs> Jehoiakim was carried away probably in the, in the first or second captivity. We're not exactly sure. The word of God came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans. Chaldean is another name for Babylon. By the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him, and I looked... Now, this is Ezekiel having a vision of what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He said, I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Comes out of the north. We said last week, and we read some verses on how the chariots, the war chariots, were called whirlwinds. I'll give you those again. Hold on. If they came out of the north, this you'll hear you'll read where destruction came on Israel from the east. Babylon is on the Euphrates River. Babylon is Iraq. That's what it is, where we had all them those wars. Here's the Persian Gulf where we had that short war in the early nineties. Just above that is Babylon on the Euphrates River. So whenever they were going to attack Israel, they had to come up here and come from the north. They came from the east, but they came from the north because this is all Arabian Desert, and you can't travel across the Arabian Desert because you've got thousands of miles of sand and heat. So they'd come up here. That's why they'd always attack Israel from the north. That's what it's talking about. When they attacked from the north, they came in their chariots. And their chariots, we said that 
the whirlwind, we said they were chariots in Isaiah 5 and 28 and Jeremiah 4 and 13, that they came like, the chariots came like whirlwinds. And in Habakkuk 3 and 14, came out of the north in a great cloud and fire enfolding itself and the brightness about it and out of the middle of these wheels of the whirlwinds or the chariots was the color of amber. Now, that word color is A, A, Y, I, N. It means color. When you see Joseph had a coat of many colors, it wasn't a coat of colors. It was a coat of pos, P-A-C. That means authority. Don't want to get on another subject, but when Joseph's brothers saw that he was 17 years old in Genesis, the 37th chapter, and his father had given him the code of authority. They meant, that meant that he was going to be ruling them at 17. And they said, we won't put up with that. And they took him and sold him into Egypt. Now, that's another story. Let's get back to here. And out of the color was the color of amber. Amber is yellow. Yellow. Fire or lightning is always throughout Scripture yellow. Now, Nahum shows us how these chariots were coming in. Look at the book of Nahum. Hosea, Jonah, and Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. All right. In Nahum, the second chapter, he's, Nahum is talking about these chariots coming in. In verse 1 of chapter 2, He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make thy loin strong. Fortify thy power mightily because the chariots are coming. And the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency, excellency of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine. And the shield of his mighty is made red with blood. The valiant men are scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches. Torches, fire, and flames is always the color of yellow. When those chariots came in, I looked at the wheels of chariots years ago. When those chariot wheels of the Babylonians come in, here's a wheel, chariot wheel. It has six spokes. The war chariots had six spokes, and they were a wheel, inside of a wheel, just the same way the human eye was. When you touch Israel, you touch the apple or the pupil of my eye. A wheel and a wheel, you punch God in the eye, and this begins to close up that inner part and, and try and pr to protect what's in the eye, which is God's color, or seven colors in the human eye as it goes through these prisms and it begins to be refined. Now, when I first saw this wheel, it was just overwhelming to me. I saw a wheel inside of a wheel. Where would be the yellow in the center of the wheel? It was those scythes, S-C-Y-T-H-E-S. Those are little swords that were on the side of these wheels. They were called iron chariots when they had those size. When they reflected, like Nam said, in the light, it looked like flashing lightning. And when they came in, they were there to refine Israel. That's what they were there for. God said, I'm not going to break my covenant with you just because you broke your covenant with me they had a sabbatical year every seven years. We had to let the land lie fallow. I can't fulfill my covenant of giving you all the crops you need, all the 
I'll fill up your storehouses if you don't abide by my covenant. Israel said, we're not going to take off every seven years and not reap anything and not harvest anything. Are you crazy, Moses? We're not doing that. You have to do that. You have to rotate crops somehow. That, that was God's ecological system so that the crops every seven years will restore the nutrients from the ground. They won't restore automatically. You grow the same and they went for 70 sets of these sabbatical years, 70 times 7, 490 years where they never rotated their crops and let the land lie fallow. And God says, I'm not going to break my covenant with you. I'll stick you over here in Babylon for 70 years. For 70 years until the land rejuvenates itself over here in Israel and if you don't keep these 70, if you don't keep the, if you don't come back after 70 years and behave yourself and worship me and stop worshiping all these sun and tree gods, which is the same thing that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christmas. You know what I want to do? I want to take off and go on Christmas there, but I ain't got time to do that. And people say, oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with Christmas. Christmas is the reason Israel was destroyed. That's the reason the World Trade Center came down. That's the reason for the war over there in Israel right now. I can tell the president, Trump, you're not going to remedy that over there. The Bible says so. I said that about Obama. You're not going to fix that. There's distractions with perplexity over there. Perplexity at the end of time. Aporia means no answer, no way out. There's not any way out of that. The way that the way that's going to be fixed is Jesus is going to come back. Now let's get back to Ezekiel. I need to get through this. All right. In verse 5. Also out of the midst there came the likeness of four living creatures. I wonder what those are. How about the sword? How about the, excuse me, I'm thinking of something else. How about man, the eagle, or the fowl, the lion, or the beast, and you're going to have these four creatures that you've got in Revelation, the fourth chapter, and Genesis, the ninth chapter. Same one. You're also going to have a rainbow here. Do you think this all has to do with each other? Certainly it does. That's why people, they, they read over here and they say, I wonder what that's doing here. And they over here, I wonder what that's doing here. And they can't connect the two together because they don't understand it's about God's covenant. These are chariots coming into Israel to slaughter Israel because they begin to go after these other gods. And God says, I'm going to put you over here in Babylon for 70 years, and then I'm going to have decrees for you to come back, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. And the, four, the three Persian kings gave those decrees to rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, I like to talk about them, but I don't need to right now. All right. So you got these four, these four creatures. Let's look at them. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Now, the word wing is not the word wing. The word wing is a word, kanaf, K-A-N-A-P-H. You got to keep this in mind. When you talk about the wing of a building, you talk about the West Wing, where the president met with his people. It doesn't mean a little bird's wing. It meant an extremity, a corner, or a border. So wherever these four creatures were, there was a border on the side of them. That was the sides of the chariots. Now, their feet were straight feet, Everyone had four faces, verse 6. Everyone had four 
extremities. And their feet were straight feet. Now we said they, they're straight, their feet, I'll get it right in a minute. All right. This is the lion with straight feet. And it goes on to say wherever the wheels went, these creatures went. They are going to be where the chariots are. And if they went up in the air, if they come over a bump, it says the creatures. They, God is using pointers to show us what this is about. I found these pictures out of some old ancient Assyrian uh, prints, in, particularly in, in the, the, you've got some in, uh, uh, gosh, one of the books I've got. You can get them out of there. Or you've got some of them in, and it's got the six spokes. The six-spoked wheel is a picture of, picture of, Yeah, well, I can't draw very good. It's a picture of the Star of David. So when they saw these chariots coming in, they saw the judgment of God coming upon them. This, Ezekiel is starting his story, his life, by telling you the destruction of Judah in 586. And he's living over in Babylon, writing these things down. This is what amazes me. People say predestination and God's sovereignty is not true. Yet he's got Ezekiel telling him what happened, what's going to happen. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Now let's keep reading here. Their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had and they had the hands of a man under their borders. The man was standing there, and he had his hands right there at the border of these beasts as he's driving his chariots in here and they're going to destroy Israel. Now, and they had the hands of the man under their wings and their, under their borders and in their sides and they four had the faces and their wings or their borders. Their wings were joined one to another and they turned not when they went they, don't, they didn't turn. They came in straight to do destruction. They went everyone straight forward. God had, the only way you can interpret this is this has to be the chariots coming into Israel to destroy them. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. That's the four creatures of Genesis 9 and Revelation, the fourth chapter. Thus were their faces and their wings, or their borders, were stretched upward in two wings. Every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. Anytime you find the cherubim, it is believed by most scholars that when northern Israel was carried into captivity that these people stole the Jewish cherubim and these are the cherubim on Assyrian, on the Assyrian monoliths and on the cylinders. Cylinders were big round things that they would draw on them. This was all Assyrian. There's the, there's the, light, there's the eagle's mouth the lion's body, the calf's body, or the ox's body, the man's head. These are all 
cherubim. They're not real living creatures. They are signs or pictures to point to us what Revelation and Ezekiel is about. Remember I said signs, Simeon, pointers. They're not literal creatures. They're imaginary creatures that God used to say, this is what I'm sending. Now, and they went everyone straight forward whither the Spirit was to go. The Spirit would be in the drivers of the chariots. They went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of lamps. It went out and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightnings. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of the flash of lightnings. Well, I've already explained the lightnings. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures and his four faces, that would be the man, the lion, and so forth. The appearance of wheels, their work was like unto the color of beryl, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it was a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. One wheel run by faith. This is what this is talking about. And as for their rings or their circles, they were so high, they were dreadful. This would be the chariots running through the streets, slaughtering and butchering the Jews. When they bounced off of the hill, the Bible says the chariots, the wheels, wherever the wheels went, the beast went because they're on the sides of their chariots. And for the, what else would Ezekiel be having to talk about in Babylon? He's telling them what the judgment's coming. And I, I need to get on with this. And when the living creatures went and the wheels went by them, when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up because they were on the sides of the chariots. Why they call them living? <laughs> well, they were living because of the men in the chariots. It was like God's living judgment against Israel. You have to put all this together. God is judging Israel. This is like synthesis. The men in the chariots are the judgment of God upon Israel because, and it goes right with Ezekiel because he's carried into the captivity. It says he's captive on the river Kibar in the first part of this. When the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. They bounce up in the air, and the creatures go with them. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The spirit of the man driving the chariots was in the wheels. This is God's way of expressing judgment. Only those of us who are interested enough, I've been studying the history of Israel for over 60 years, and this is everything that I can see. In fact, I was reading about the chariots in McClinic and Strong, and they didn't agree with this, that this was chariots. But they said men like, they named this scholar's name, like so-and-so believed these were chariots, Babylonian chariots coming. I said, yeah, and like Jim Brown, too. He believes that. I got a question. What? Why did they put the cherubim in the... That was just their way of... This was their gods. They took everything and made gods out of them. They made gods out of everything. They put their gods into battle. Sometimes they'd take their gods on a wagon, bring them into battle. Say, our gods will make you submit. You have to understand the Assyrian way of thinking and the Babylonian way That's of thinking. One of the did, yeah. Well, uh, the Sphinx may very well be. The Sphinx had a lion's body and a man's head. It was probably part of this same picture. 
men have studied the Sphinx and hadn't been able to come up with an answer. This is the closest thing that I can see for the Sphinx. Then he says, when these, when those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. They all stood still at the same time and were lifted up from the earth and the wheels were lifted up over against them for the spirit of the living God was in the wheels. What was he doing in the wheels? This was his judgment. He said, I'm going to slaughter Israel. I told you I was going to do this. And he did. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And it goes on through here, and let me get down here in verse 27. I just don't have time to get to all this. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within, from the appearance of his loins, even upward from the appearance of his loins, even downward. And I saw it were as the appearance of fire. It had the appearance round about. It's talking about God comes in, in this vision. It's like he's a part of this attack on Israel. Then it says in verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. You got the rainbow here. You got the four creatures. You got the will and the will, which is the eyes. This is God's way of giving us an understanding of what he did to Israel. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and heard a voice that spake. He said unto me, Son of man, that's the way the Lord would approach Ezekiel. Son of man, stand upon thy feet. I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation. This, he tells you in chapter 2 what it's all about to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me and their fathers have transgressed against me. And you want to know what it's all about? Read any of the prophets. All of them will tell you this is God's judgment on Israel. And he scattered them all over the earth, didn't bring them back till May of 1948. And the reason they're having those wars over there in the Middle East is over this very thing. This is where he's scattering them. They've transgressed against me even to this day. For they are impudent children, stiff-necked. Mona, you can understand this, can't you? Israel was stiff-necked. I do send thee unto them to tell them you don't have any more chance. He even says in the 16th chapter, or excuse me, 14th chapter of this book, I'm not going to deliver them. He said in the 14th chapter, he said, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. I won't deliver any of the people in Israel. Ezekiel was not a prophet of conversion. He was a prophet of doom. That's all I consider myself, a preacher of doom in America because America's not going to repent. Go back to chapter 2. They're an impudent and they're impudent children, stiff necked, and I'm sending you to them, Ezekiel, to tell them. There were a certain number of them over in Babylon, so he says, You preach to them in Babylon. I'll use Jeremiah and others to preach to them over there in Israel. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, They, whether they will hear or whether they will not, will forbear, means not hear. For they are a rebellious house. Yet ye shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. them. They'll know that there's been a prophet when you tell them what they've done. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. Don't be afraid of these people when you preach to them. 
He said the same thing to Jeremiah in the first chapter. You go out and preach to these people in the gates of the city. Thou doest, thou dost dwell among scorpions. Ah, I love that. Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions in Babylon. Be not afraid of their words. Scorpions. have words. Scorpions are evil people. That takes us to Revelation the ninth chapter, doesn't it? <laughs> Revelation 9. Run over there because you can't even read this verse without understanding Revelation 9. Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions. They preach the wrong words. Revelation 9. I said I was going to get to chapter 9, but I probably won't get there today. I wanted to get there because chapter 9 of Ezekiel is equal to chapter 7 of Revelation. All right. Revelation 9. I can't preach this without telling you what chapter 8 is about. There's seven angels in chapter 8 that's been given seven trumpets. The seven angels, according to the first chapter of Revelation, are the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. That's in verse 16 of the first chapter. Verse 20 tells you what the seven stars and the seven candlesticks are. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which are in the right hand of Christ, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, what other the seven golden candlesticks are, the seven golden candlesticks, the Bible says in Zechariah the fourth chapter, are the eyes of the Lord. When you look at the candlesticks, well, actually, it's easier up here. When you look at the candlesticks from the top, it's a star of David. These seven are the eyes of the Lord in Zechariah 4 and 10. The seven candlesticks are the eyes. Remember the pupil of his eye? Israel is the apple of my eye, the pupil. You have to think about these things. Then you go back to Revelation. Revelation 9. These seven angels have been given seven trumpets. A trumpet is a voice. A trumpet tells you what to do if you're a soldier. That's what it does. When you get up in the morning, you hear reveille. I went to military school. That's reveille. That means get up. It's time to get up. If you hear taps, that's to go to bed. If you hear da 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 that's charge. Trumpets, every time you see them in Scripture, mean something. They tell you what to do. You read that 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it'll tell you a trumpet without a distinctive sound, you get confused and you don't know what to do. Talking about tongues, it has to be distinct. Then he says here in chapter 9, well, let's look at the sounding of the trumpets. Verse 6 in chapter 8. The seven angels which, thou, which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. You see, they've got the seven trumpets in verse 2. The first angel sounds in verse 7. Second angel sounds in verse 8. Verse 10, the third angel sounds and a great star falls from heaven. The star is the seven stars in his right hand, which are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches. So they're giving a, they're giving a signal or giving a message. And then the fourth angel sounds in verse 12. Chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. The stars are the message of the angels. 
and to him that was given the key of the bottomless pit. I keep saying bottomless pit is a terrible translation. Terrible. Because you've got scorpions come, you've got locusts come out of the bottomless pit in chapter 9. You've got locusts coming out of the pit in chapter 9. Bottomless pit. That's a bad translation. I hate that translation. But you had to remember half the translators were Roman Catholic. They got to keep it mysterious. And you got the locusts coming out of the pit. Locusts, which are like scorpions. That's in chapter Revelation 9. You've got, you got the beast coming out of the pit, out of the bottomless pit. In chapter 11, Revelation 11, and you got Satan locked in the bottomless pit in Revelation 20. How can that be? It's the meaning of the word bottomless pit. The word is actually A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. That's our word abyss. If you go down in South America and you stand on one of them real, I can't even spell, A-B-Y-S-S. -S. If you go on top of one of them big waterfalls about a thousand feet, you look down into it and you'll say, and there'll be all kind of foam and foggy looking things. You'll say, that's an abyss. I wonder what's down there. Abyss, that's what an abyss means. It's a form of bathos or bathizo. Bathos means something with great knowledge. With knowledge. When you place the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a, a word as a negative particle, it negates the word, gives it opposite meaning. Bottomless pit is abathos. Bathos is the same word in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, when the Bible speaks of the deep things of God, the great intellectual things of God. That's the word bathos. Abathos means no knowledge. That's what it means. So the beast comes out of the place of no knowledge. The locust comes out of the place of no knowledge. And Satan is locked in the place of no knowledge. When you look at the Mediterranean Sea, the beast had its borders on the Mediterranean Sea. That's why it says the beast comes out of the sea in Revelation 10 and 1. That's not even hard if you know what these things mean. Let me get over here to... I'll get over to it in a minute. Here. The beast was the Babylonian lion... Babylon was here, and ruled all over in here, and then Babylon was overthrown by, by a, uh, Persia. Persia is, is uh, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, and so forth. And Persia ruled all over in here. And Persia had its borders on the sea. And then Persia was overthrown by the Grecian leopard, Greece here. Alexander the Great was from northern Greece, and he overthrew the Persian leopard, and he ruled on the sea. So the beast rises up out of the sea, or the place of no knowledge, because no one had any knowledge of God except Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. They're the only ones that had the knowledge. How did the scorpions come up out of this? And the Lord tells Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions 
be not afraid of their words. Scorpion is the word scorpios. S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S. Let me erase some of this. S-K-O-R. I'm sorry I can't get through this any faster, but it's... When he tells Ezekiel you dwell among scorpions, here's the word. Scorpios. And in the Greek, you have a noun and a verb form of the noun. The verb form is scorpizo. Means to scatter. What is that word that God used constantly to Israel? I will scatter you all over the earth. How did he do that? With the beast world ruling system, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. That's what he did it with. Now, look over here in John, the 10th chapter. John 10. Here is the verb form of scorpion. We're going to look at it. John 10. I wish I could get through this faster, but I can't. If I'm at anywhere in prophecy... It's more than I can get to. I can say a thousand things about these things, but I don't have time in one lesson. All right. John 10. This is the parable of the Good Shepherd. It is signs and pictures. When, when Jesus said, He that entereth not in, he that Verse 1, Verily I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And Jesus said, Be, he, that, he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Back in Jesus' day and before his day, you'd have a bunch of shepherds would get together they would fence in, say, five acres. And they would have they would have thorns. They would put rocks around it. And they would put and they had a little opening here. Didn't have a door on it, on the opening. But the, everybody would bring their sheep in, and one guy would bring his sheep and make them sit out in that corner. Another guy would let his sit up here. Another one down here. And the eldest shepherd would lay down in the middle of that doorway with one eye open all night long. He'd have his Sabian dagger in his hand. Say, I challenge any wolf to come and get my sheep. You're going to die if you try to take my sheep. That's why he said he was the door. He was the door. The elder shepherd was called the door of the sheep. He led there to protect him. And then he goes on in here and he says, in chapter 10, I'm just going to shorten this. Everyone that comes another way is a thief and a robber. I'm the good shepherd, verse 11. Good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming. What is a wolf? In the seventh chapter of Matthew. It's what? False prophet. It's a false teacher. Paul said, ravening wolves will come into Ephesus in the 20th chapter of Acts. When I leave, ravening wolves will come in. False teachers will come in. And leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. That word scattereth is the verb form of scorpion. Wolves are same thing as scorpions. They're false teachers. 
So when you see back to Revelation 11, how much time do I have, Mike? I'm just barely getting started where I want to go here. Go back to Revelation 11. Not Revelation 11, Revelation 9. Had Revelation 11 on the mind. All right. See, these are pointers is what they are. They signify. They're signs. If you see scorpion, you dwell among scorpions, Ezekiel. Be not afraid of their words. Scorpions are false teachers, and they have the wrong words. They preach another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Now back to Revelation 9. How are the locusts like scorpions? The Jews were terrified to see locusts coming. They were up to, I've got a picture of locusts eating up a tree in just minutes. They stripped the tree of every leaf. It shows the tree before, and minutes later it shows it after, and there's nothing on it. The Jews were scared to death of locusts. Locust was a picture of famine, God's great judgment. Sword, famine, pestilence. The famine could come with no rain, like Elijah said, no rain for three and a half years, or too much rain, like Samuel said in the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel. If you don't obey God, he'll send too much rain and wash your crops away, and they go, oh, please don't do that. Or they could come, somebody gave me this along the way, locust. They got crouch written on the side. <laughs> Locusts were bigger than that. They were like great big huge grasshoppers up to five and six inches long, and they could strip land in just no time. And they came in the hundreds of billions. They didn't come just a few of them. I've seen them down in Texas. I've seen grasshoppers covering entire acres. When we wanted to go fishing, we'd just go out in those acres and pull a bunch of grasshoppers. I'd go down to the creek, put them on the hook, and catch a bunch of brim, whatever that is. All right. Then he opened the bottomless pit, or the place of no knowledge, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, what is the smoke? It's pride. conceit and pride. When Paul gives you the same thing in 1 Timothy, he says, people who, if any man consents not to hold some words, he's proud, knowing nothing. He knows, doesn't know anything. That's no knowledge a man that preaches the end of the word. That's in, in 1 Timothy 6 and 3 and 4. The man is proud to follow. You got three words for pride. This word is to follow, T-U-P-H-O-O. It is a form of to floss. It means to blow smoke, you hear people talk about blowing smoke. This is probably where it comes from. Be conceited. It means smoke with no fire, no fiery trials. That's what conceited, that's what to floss means. It means smoke, a lot of smoke, no fire. So this is pride of the scorpions. He opened the bottom of his pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as of a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. That's very important. When these locusts would come in the hundreds of billions, they might block the light of the sun for 20 miles wide 
and 10 miles deep, and you couldn't see anything. They came to devour Israel because of their going after other gods. And that was famine. And it terrified them. They, you've seen old movies where these locusts will come in and the farmers will get crazy and try to dig trenches and burn off a certain uh, mount to stop the locusts from coming. They were terrified when they saw locusts. What did the locusts do? They stole the locusts stole the food of the people. What do the scorpions, the false teachers do? They steal the nomos. That's the word law. They steal the law from the people and it becomes no law. Anomos or anomia, which is the word iniquity, means no food, no legal food. This is false teachers, and this is the locust. They are like because they do the same thing. I've never heard a preacher say that because he don't study enough Greek to know it. So. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were like scorpions, and it was commanded to them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. These are not locusts that are going to eat up the grass or eat up your food crop. This is scorpions are going to eat up your law neither any green tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. And that's not a computer chip. I'll get to that when I get to Revelation 7. Now let's go back over here. Do I have any time? I'm going to get to... I'm going to get to... Uh, Ezekiel 9, one of these days. I really want to get there because that's an equivalent chapter to Revelation 7. You're, you're, God is marking, God has got a man with an, with an ink pen marking the people that are left in Israel that are poor and downtrodden and they're not going to be destroyed. They're the ones that's left in Israel. Only the Men, the artificers and metal, did Nebuchadnezzar carry away so they could make weapons to destroy him or to fight him. Now, look over here in Ezekiel. Back to Ezekiel. I was in that chapter. I'm trying to show you the way you look at the Old Testament You've got to look at it. If you're reading Revelation, you've got to look at Old Testament. You can't find their answers to Revelation in Revelation without knowing what the Old Testament says. And look here in verse 6 of chapter 2 of Ezekiel. After he says, Israel is a rebellious people. They go after these other gods. Christmas. Verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, thou, dwell, thou dwellest among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Talking about southern Judah. Because northern Israel has been scattered about 150 years before this. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, whether they won't hear. For they are rebellious. God says that over and over and over again through his prophets. America is rebellious. America is crazy. The preachers are insane. I say that because I never heard anybody even deal with this, have you? Now, 
But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give you. Now, what is he going to eat? The word of God, the nomos, the legally prescribed food for animals, in our case, sheep. And when I looked, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and, I would, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. He's talking about the Word of God bringing this judgment on Israel. This reminds me of Revelation 10 and 9. Look at Revelation 10 and 9. Revelation 10 and let's start here in verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book. We see that little book in the fourth chapter. Who is, who is worthy to open the little book? But the little book has to be the seven stars in the right hand of Christ because they are the seven angels. The word angel, angelos, means messengers. They're the seven messengers of the seven churches, and they're the ones that's going to preach what's in the book. Now, this reminds us of the Bible that we read. Take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth, in the hand of Jesus. Previous to this chapter, he's got one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and says, time is no more. And I went unto the angel and said, Give me the little book, the little book about your judgments. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, the same thing he said over there in Ezekiel, the second chapter. And it shall make thy belly, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. You know what that's like? That exactly tells us what reading the Word of God is like. We look and we see predestination's true. For whom He did foreknow, we also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. We see that daily cross is true. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. We see that Christmas is Christ's Mass and that's paganism. But we go out to tell the world these things and it becomes bitter in our belly, doesn't it? That's exactly what he's describing here, and that's what he was describing in Ezekiel, the second chapter. And thy mouth is sweet as honey, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. It was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again, before many people and nations and tongues and kings. I'm just about out of time, ain't I, Mike? Four. Four minutes. I'll begin chapter 3 in Ezekiel. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel the words that you eat. Jesus said, I have a meat to eat of, that you apostles don't know it. It's to do the will of my Father. That's my meat. So I opened my mouth, and it caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill the bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey sweet for sweetness. But it was bitter in my stomach. Predestination is the most wonderful, bitter doctrine in the Bible. It's wonderful, and when we try to tell the world, it is bitter. And I got so much more to say on Ezekiel. So you can see, now what Ezekiel is doing, 
He's going through his book telling you what's going to happen to Israel over here. He tells you all about it. He tells you what they're doing. When you get into that eighth chapter, he's talking about while, it, while Ezekiel's over in Babylon, he's telling you that there's 25 men standing in front of the temple facing east, worshiping the sun. They're having a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus is born, worshiping the sun in the 8th chapter of Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, this is why I'm going to destroy them. They won't quit. And America won't quit. I said this earlier. I don't believe I'm a preacher of conversion. I believe I'm a preacher of judgment. The chariots of God are going to come into this, not literal chariots. The eyes of the Lord are going to come in and destroy America before this is over with. Mr. Trump don't have any answers. Neither did Obama. Neither did Bill Clinton. Neither did the Bushes. They didn't have any answers. Ronald Reagan, the good guy, didn't have any answers. And he wasn't as good as you think he was. Am I out of time, Mike? Whew. I just don't have time to proceed further. What I want to do is you're going to find these four creatures in the 10th chapter of this book. They're everywhere. Verse 14 of chapter 10. I saw four creatures, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second, the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. You got them all over the place. And then you got the 25 men in verse 1 of chapter 11. And then in chapter 8, chapter 8, you got the same 25 men worshiping the sun in verse 16. And God has to destroy them. And that they're standing in front of the temple facing east. The only people that go, in, go into the temple area were the Levites. So when you see these men facing the sun, worshiping the sun at a sunrise service, that's they're worshiping Tammuz. And how much time, how many times have we gone through that? Easter, Ishtar, Ostern in Germany, was a, was a term for the goddess of Easter, the Eastern goddess. I'm out of time. I'll have to come back and work my way into chapter 9 and when I can get to it. I hope this wasn't too confusing to you. You realize you can't study the Bible without getting into detail and the pointers and what they meant. You have to get into... We understand signs. We drive down the street and it says, uh, it says Cracker Barrel. We know that's a place to eat, but if you brought somebody out of, out of the first century and had them ride with you, say Cracker Barrel, what does that mean? Is that a barrel in there with crackers in it? It's a sign. If you see a sign that says, <laughs> I saw a, what's that real popular bond headed girl and her family that owns the big hotels, and she is just a. Hilton, Paris huh? Hilton. Yeah, Paris Hilton. She said one time she was staying with this working class people, and they said, We need to go to Walmart. And she said, Is that where they sell walls? That's Paris Hilton that said that. One of the most brilliant scholars of all time. <laughs> Walmart. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Teach us your word. Lord, we know we have to study a lot of details to find out what it means. Because we don't live 2,000 years ago. That's the whole thing. Thank you for truth. Fight our battles for us. We can't fight. We give you praise for everything. 
everything. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I wish I could do this easier, but it's not easy. They're just figurative. <laughs> Your head's straightened out now. Yeah, it makes sense. Perfect well, it does make sense. What you doing? That's your mama. What are you doing, guy? You love me? You love Papa? You're nearly as big as me, aren't you? What'd you do there? And on the back, it's got Bible scripture. Was that the back? I don't on the know. I don't it's know. It's really pretty. And one of them has got Darth Vader on the front of it. Are you still into him? Yes. Well, I don't know if it'll. I don't know if it'll fit in. Well, they're for both of you. Some of them are fourteen. Some of them are sixteen. I didn't know what size you. Were. I love you. And I got you some. I got you some khaki pants. You know what khakis are? Pretty much what I'm wearing for shorts. But they're catchy, they're moving around. And your pants are. I think they're having nightmares. They need Who? to change. These crazy people riding these weird. <laughs> strange. What is this? Um, it's lasagna. My dad made it for you. Lasagna? Lasagna. <laughs> lasagna? It's spelled lasagna, though, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. I think those people writing those letters are eating the wrong food. They're having nightmares. They're crazy. <laughs> you said that. Don't nobody eat that. Hey, Steve. Okay. Some pictures of it or something. Okay. Huh? Little growth spurt there. I'm almost this tall as Mary. Who's as tall as you are? Oh my goodness, both of them. Uh -huh. Told you here. Stand up straight. Drop a big Come on, stand up straight. Put your arms, your shoulders back. Shoulders back. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Look at these two. <laughs> They're getting so tall. He's on yeah, the they are getting tall. They're nearly as tall as me. Yeah. Just about. What you doing there, girl? Doing pretty good. good. How you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. How you doing? I'm Teresa. Teresa. Rose Jackson's daughter. You whose? Rose Jackson's daughter. Oh really? Yes. Well, it's good to have yes, you here. We love Rose. Here. She's one of yeah. our favorite people. Yeah. Glad to be here. Teresa. Mm -hmm. Where do you live? In Kansas City. You I'm live in Kansas City. Uh -huh. See you later. Yeah. Take care. It's good to see you, Thank you. I'm so happy to We're be here. We're glad you're here. I am too. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Okay. Teresa. Where did... She's from Kansas City. Guess where he's from. You're from Missouri? Yep. Okay. St. Louis area. Yep. Yeah. Where did... Uh, Are you looking for him? Yes. Where did okay. Ben go? Is Ben in here? Is he still here? Yeah.